focused on real valued underlyings. Um, this is joint work with Lorenzo Torricelli, who's a professor at University of Parma in Italy. So um, as many of you know, uh, we had um, negative oil futures prices recently, and this prompted the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to change the model they officially use for marking options from the benchmark Black Merton Scholes model to instead the Bachelier model. And, um, um, and in fact, this, let's say the Bachelier model is already being used in over-the-counter interest rate options markets. So the way people talk about implied volatility for say swaptions is using the Bachelier model implied volatility. And um, so, um, and that's of course, because interest rates have, are negative in many countries. And um, <clears throat> actually in the US, <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there's, there's currently derivatives which would only have value if interest rates are are negative and you know they have a they have a positive value so so it seems like even in the U.S. it's coming um, so um, so these realizations that interest rates and oil futures prices can be negative has renewed interest in option pricing models where the underlying rate or security value is real value and uh, back in 1900 a long time ago the father of our craft Bachelier directly assumed that the price of a security underlying an option is a driftless arithmetic Brownian motion, which of course can go negative. So Bachelier assumes zero drift under P or the statistical probability measure. And um, we're gonna take a kind of a more modern view of his work and um, think of his assumption of driftless arithmetic Brownian motion as, as sort of happening under Q, an equivalent risk neutral probability measure. And um, so, I'm also going to present an alternative to the Bachelier model that's simpler and may well be more realistic and also has advantages when thinking about early exercise in the second half of this talk. So um, both of the models we'll be looking at allow future prices of the underlying risky, I should say security there, <laughs> to change sign. I don't like to use the word asset when the price can be negative. <laughs> I think it confuses people, so I meant to write security there. And um, so the... Um, so again, the futures price, the future prices of the underlying risky security can change sign in contrast to the standard Black Merton Scholes model, where it's one sign only. Um, as an aside, you can actually deal with negative things in the Black Merton Scholes model. It's just that they stay negative forever. So the real issue with the model is not that it's say it only allows positive underlyings, because it doesn't, but it's that the sign is fixed whatever sign you start with is the sign you have for the rest of time. Okay, so there's gonna be five parts to this talk and um, we're going to, um, I'll take questions in between each part. So you can sort of think of there being four opportunities in between the talk to ask questions as well as time at the end. So uh, here's an overview of this talk. Um, I wanna start by just reviewing the Bachelier put pricing formula I'll be focused on puts, not calls, just because um, we'll also be interested in their derivatives and that'll be set up to give you a distribution function as opposed to a complementary distribution function, which is, you know, let's say the more standard thing is to focus on a distribution function. So, um, but of course, everything I say for puts has its counterpart for calls. And um, so the, we'll start by doing a classical probability based Derivation won't take long to get to the famous Bachelier put pricing formula. And then I'll present a kind of a novel derivation using convex duality that sets the stage for the alternative model, which will be called the logistic model, uh, which will also be, let's say, promoted using convex duality. And um, then I'll explore common features of the two pricing formulas in the Bachelier model and the logistic model and also differences. So let's begin. Um, so there's assumptions that are holding throughout the talk and I thought I should let you know what they are. Um, they're pretty strong. Most of them can be relaxed. Um, so we're gonna have an economy with a riskless asset. Um, also a risky security. So a security's price varies through time. And finally, 
there'll be at least one option lurking about whose job it is for us to price. So the option's written on the risky security. <clears throat> and um, we're going to assume, for simplicity, mainly no frictions, so no transactions costs, et cetera. No default. So you know, let's say if someone promises to pay, for example, a hockey stick payoff, they actually do, <laughs> regardless of how big it is. And um, we're going to assume no arbitrage, which is standard. We're going to assume no carrying costs. So I'll, I'll explore that a little bit. But um, it'll basically mean that for simplicity, we're going to have things like zero interest rates, zero dividends, zero convenience yield, <laughs> zero and zero storage costs. And you might think that, well, aren't I taking away the reason for prices to be negative in the first place? Because with the oil futures, I mean, it's widely agreed that the reason for the negative price was the high storage costs or the lack of storage space equivalently. And um, well, that's, I would call that a reason, um, but you know, let's remember that um, there are other underlyings and they don't always have to have limited liability. And so, um, so anyway, for just whatever reason, I'm gonna allow the underlying to be negative and then for simplicity, I'm not really explaining why um, the underlying can be negative. Okay, so, um, so this, we're, we're not gonna be thinking about American style options except towards the end. I'll actually bring something related to that up. So for most of this talk, there'll be no early exercise. And that's actually a consequence of a no carry assumption. So this, for example, if you have an American put on a stock and we'll let the price of the stock or whatever it is go negative and there's no interest rates, so interest rates are zero, then um, you can show that an American put would never be exercised early. Um, if the interest rate is negative or zero, yeah, that's true. And um, okay, so um, so okay, so we're dealing with European options, and um, the fact that we're assuming no arbitrage implies there exists a risk-neutral probability measure Q, such that all security prices are martingales under it. So um, so that's called a fundamental theorem of asset pricing. Notice I haven't yet said that this risk neutral measure is unique. And um, let's say in the Bashi model it will be, but in the competitive model it need not be. Okay. So here's the Bashi model. It has additional assumptions besides the ones I just mentioned. And um, the main assumption is at this top equation, which is that if you let little s the underlying securities spot price, then the top equation is indicating that the price of the underlying security is following what's called driftless arithmetic Brownian motion. So it's being written in quote integrated form there, but if you wanted to write it as an Edo stochastic differential equation, you easily could. It would be ds is a of t dw. And um, so just so we're clear on what everything is, the s0 that you're seeing there right after the equal sign is the real valued um, value of the underlying at the valuation time, which is T0. So, um, so it's known. And um, the A of T is the volatility parameter in the Bachelier model. I use A because it's, a, it's actually denominated in dollars per square root of a year. So it's, it's not the same units as say the volatility in Black Shoals. And um, so I need a different letter to capture that. And um, let's say I'm making it deterministic here, but not stochastic. So that's just for generality. If you want to make A a constant, I won't object. Um, so um, W here is a standard brownian motion under the risk neutral measure Q. So I'm adopting kind of standard approach that practitioners often take, which is to pick dynamics under Q, you know, under the assumption of no arbitrage, we know we're okay. So uh, capital T here, which is the last time we're considering in this model is uh, the options fixed maturity date. And um, I'll be working a lot with pine maturity, which will be tau. And, um, 
So the, um, in the Bachelier model, let's say what sort of plays a primary role in determining the options price is the standard deviation of the price at maturity. And um, now I could use the letter S to capture that standard deviation, but I've already used the letter S to capture the spot price. So I'm using a different letter to capture the standard deviation. And for reasons that will be totally mysterious to all of you, I'm using the letter B um, to capture the standard deviation of the underlying security price at maturity. And um, or tell units of time ahead more generally. And um, so you can think of B as standing for bewilderment about the uh, width of the, dis about the security price at tau units of time ahead. So it is the standard deviation in the Bachelet model, but we'll be using another model where we'll also be using the letter B and it won't be the standard deviation. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, the, um, this function B of tau would be, for example, if volatility were constant, it would be um, the constant A times the square root of tau. So that would be this, when the instantaneous volatility is constant in the Bachelet model, A times square root of tau would be the standard deviation of the security price, tau units of time ahead. And, it would, and you know, as, as time to maturity shrinks, the standard deviation of the price at the end of the time interval gets smaller. And um, we're going the other way, as tau increases, so is the standard deviation. So this B of tau is an increasing deterministic function of tau. And as time maturity goes to zero, as you're nearing maturity, so is the standard deviation underlying going to zero. So that's being captured. <clears throat> so it'll turn out that we won't need, let's say, the instantaneous volatility and time separately, they'll enter through this function B of tau. And um, we're gonna start by just reviewing how to price a binary put in the Bachelet model and then graduate to a vanilla put shortly thereafter. So a binary put has a strike price being denoted by little k, a real number, and it pays $1 just if underlying security price at its maturity is lower than the strike and zero otherwise. So the uh, payoffs are one or zero, that's why it's called binary. And um, let's say, given the arithmetic Brownian motion that's describing the underlying security price, it's pretty simple to value a binary put in this model. So the pricing formula is being denoted by binary put with superscript B for Bachelier, three arguments, K for strike, B of tau for standard deviation underlying, S for current spot. And um, as usual, no arbitrage implies, all you gotta do is compute the expectation of payoff under risk neutral measure, which is easily done in this model and is expressible via standard normal distribution function cap n, whose argument is what you might call the moneyness of the binary put. So strike minus spot divided by standard deviation. So, you know, the statistical Z score that comes up in, let's say statistics, uh, where you take a random variable, subtract its mean, divide by its standard deviation, is also arising here, except that what we're actually using in place of the random variable is the strike. So the so take the strike, subtract the mean of final spot, which is the current spot, divide by the standard deviation of final spot, which is, which is this b, and you have the argument of the standard normal distribution function. Um, so when you feed that argument to the standard normal distribution function, you get a number between zero and one which is the price of a binary put under zero interest rates, as we're assuming. Okay, <clears throat> so, um, so that's pricing a binary put. And then from there, it's sort of a short step to value a vanilla put in this model. So a vanilla put has a hockey stick payoff and um, the hockey stick payoff could be expressed mathematically as strike minus final security price positive part. And um, it turns out that this hockey stick payoff can be represented as a sort of partial spatial integral of the binary payoffs. So each binary payoff is kind of like a brick, if you were to graph it. And then if you stack a bunch of bricks on top of each other, kind of um, not completely on top of each other, sort of <laughs> shading over, you'll, uh, you'll end up with the vanilla put payoff. And um, so now if we, 
take conditional expectations, conditioning on the current price of these two payoffs, the one on the left, the one on the right, which are equal, then um, you'll get on the left the vanilla put value, and on the right, you can pass the expectation operator through the integral and eventually realize that you have to do nothing but integrate the binary put formula we just showed on the last slide from minus infinity, which is the lowest possible security price in this model, to K, which is the strike of the vanilla put. So let's say sticking in the binary put formula into the integral, um, let's say you have to do an integration by parts, which I didn't show, um, to get it in the form that Bachelier presented more than a century ago. So in the middle of this slide is the vanilla put pricing formula of Bachelier. So VP stands for vanilla put. The superscript B is because it's Bachelier's. The three arguments are the same as for the binary put, strike, standard deviation underlying B, and current security price S. And now the formula is a little more complicated than it was for just the binary put. In fact, the binary put formula is kind of in the vanilla put formula. The binary put formula, if you remember it, and it's on the top right, is multiplying k minus s, so strike minus spot, in the first term. And then there's a second term that involves the standard normal density function n prime. And, um, you know, the, so this is his famous formula. So it's, you know, somewhat similar to the Black-Scholes formula, but not identical. And um, for example, there's no n prime per se in the Black-Scholes formula, there's only cumulative normals. So, um, so this is the Bachelier put formula, and we've kind of done a probabilistic derivation of it. So here it is again at the top of the slide, but I've introduced, you know, sort of looked back at it and realized that every time there was a K and an S, there was also a minus sign in between them. So we might as well simplify the formula by writing it in terms of the excess of strike over spot, which will be denoted by X for excess. So that is a measure of moneyness of the put. And um, the formula at the top of the slide looks slightly simpler than the one on the previous slide because it's being written in terms of strike minus spot X and standard deviation of actually that random variable, strike minus spot at maturity because changing the sign of S and, and adding a constant K doesn't change standard deviation. So you might as well think of B as the standard deviation of strike minus spot at maturity. And um, okay, so here's the formula again. And um, notice that X appears three times on this right-hand side. But if we differentiate with respect to X to get something like delta, but it's actually more like a strike derivative, then um, you'll, you'll find that quite surprisingly, let's say, um, two of the three instances of X cancel with each other and you only get this simple result that the strike derivative is just the risk neutral probability of the put finishing in the money. So we've all probably seen that cancellation in the Black-Scholes formula and it happens here again <laughs> and wondered why did it happen and I'll actually give you an answer for why in the Bachelier context in this talk uh, but it also applies for Black-Scholes. So anyway, the, um, so, the, so the vanilla put value is obviously increasing in strike minus spot, but let's say the maximum slope is one. And, um, so, and that's happening only at maturity. So the um, right-hand side of the top equation is well known to have a financial interpretation as the cost of a dynamic replicating portfolio. Now you've probably seen it in Black-Scholes and taught it a hundred thousand times, but let's do it in the Bachelier context. And um, so we're going to think of the, the risky asset that you're trading dynamically, not as the quote security price S, but instead as um, a forward contract and more precisely a short forward contract. So consider, Let's start with a short forward contract. So um, you, you know, agree to sell some asset currently worth S for some fixed amount K. 
and um, you're obligating yourself to do that no matter what happens in the future. There's no defaulting here. The value is um, today is K, the amount you're going to receive, um, because there's no discounting, less as the current price. And um, so we're, we're calling that X, excess of strike over spot. And you can see that it's the first thing that is arising after the equal sign at the top. So it's being multiplied by this Q norm. And that's the number of short forward contracts you're holding in this dynamic replicating portfolio. So we're thinking of the short forward contract as one thing. Don't, in your mind, break it up into a riskless asset and the, let's say, quote, the stock or, or the thing worth S. I'm just thinking of it as one thing that you trade directly. And um, you're holding N of them. And then you're also holding in the second term cash. So that second term is going to be the amount invested in a riskless asset. We'll just call that a cash reserve. It's a positive amount. So we're replicating a put here. You shouldn't be too surprised that you have a positive amount in the riskless asset. Um, although it's not completely obvious when the, um, the risky asset is actually thought of as a short forward contract. So anyway, um, that's how we're thinking. And um, okay, so this last term that's highlighted at the top depends on B, which is a standard deviation of the, okay, either the spot price asset maturity or, or um, the short forward position with a terminal value of strike minus final spot. So, um, so anyway, as time maturity goes to zero, this B goes to zero, I told you before, and it's written at the bottom of the slide. And so this last term will also go to zero as time maturity goes to zero. So what's happening here is you're replicating a put and let's say you're holding, we're calling them short forward contracts, each worth X, you're holding N of them, and you also have cash, but a positive amount of cash. But as time goes by, the sort of cash reserve gets depleted by the dynamic rebalancing in the forward contracts. And in fact, when you get to maturity, the cash reserve is completely depleted, becomes worth zero, and so you just finish at maturity holding this Q norm number of forward contracts with the denominator uh, in the fraction of the argument being zero. So B has gone to zero. So this Q norm will resolve to either zero or one. So it'll resolve to one if you're in the money with the put and zero otherwise. So that's how it works. And um, so I'm gonna introduce an interesting concept. I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, called a um, tangency portfolio value function. And that's because I want to start using context duality. But where we are now is I've basically done the first of five parts of this talk. So I've, um, let's say, um, completed how to think about the Bachelier put pricing formula from a probabilistic perspective. And um, so I see that I've got a, a question, and so now's a good time for me to try and answer it. So Gustavo asked, can the assumption of no carrying costs be relaxed? And um, it was my impression that the fact that there are no significant carrying costs is, oh, that there are significant carrying costs, sorry, is what drove oil futures price to negative. So your impression is correct. And can the assumption be relaxed? Yes, it can. So, um, you know, actually most treatments of the Bachelier model definitely allow interest rates. And I'm sure what you're worrying about is storage costs as well. And so indeed there are um, models that explicitly incorporate storage costs. And, um, you know, I, I imagine what you wanna do is, um, you know, is directly, is endogenize the dynamics of S and um, one can do that. You know, it's sort of analogous to, uh, let's say, um, just as Black-Scholes, for example, did not only price an equity option, but thought of equity as itself, an option on the assets of the firm. <laughs> one can similarly take this thing I'm calling S and treat it as, quote, a derivative um, whose value is affected by storage costs, among other things. 
the model would unlikely deliver the dynamics for us that we're seeing here, just as Black-Scholes model, when they talked of equity as an option on the assets of the firm, did not have the equity price being, quote, logarithmically distributed in that part of their paper. So, um, so basically, you can relax the assumption and you will, you know, chances are you'll get away from the Bachelier model in particular. Okay, so that's my answer to that. And um, I don't see any other questions. So um, I see we're up to 75 participants though. So I'm going to um, move ahead, but anytime you wanna ask a question, go ahead and type it in. And when I get to the next break, I'll um, be sure to address it. So what we're gonna do now is try to think of the, we're gonna rederive this um, bachelier put pricing formula, but from a different perspective. So not so much a probabilistic perspective. We're going to emphasize instead the fact that the vanilla put value function is convex in what we're calling X, the, which is strike minus spot. So, um, okay, so I, um, and, um, so I want to introduce a concept called tangency portfolio value function. Um, as a reminder, at the top here, we have the vanilla put value function. And um, that's a function of x and b. And so if I were to differentiate with respect to x, as I mentioned before, you get this curious cancellation. And you get the risk neutral probability that the put finishes in the money. So you we're going to do something you may not be used to, but we're basically going to change our view of what's driving uncertainty. So to start off with being S, we actually quickly switch to X, which is strike minus spot. Uh, and now we're going to switch again to the sort, what's driving uncertainty is the probability of finishing in the money itself. Like, so you may not be used to thinking about options this way, but we're basically going to be saying, Hey, um, we can, you know, we can, we can um, kind of think of, you know, where, how, how deep in the money we are, not by the level of spot, not by the difference between strike and spot, but by the probability that we are going to finish in the money at maturity. And you may have resisted doing that in the past because let's say you couldn't see it directly. Well, that depends on the market you're in. Um, so, in currencies, for example, there's liquid markets in binary options, and you actually can see this probability directly. And um, even if you can't, you can still pick dynamics for it, not knowing where it is now. And um, let's say, explore the implications of those dynamics for the current level, uh, always being arbitrage free. So, so it's not crazy to think about the original source of uncertainty as the probability of finishing in the money, and we're basically gonna take that view for a little while. So, <clears throat> so the, we're gonna give a name to this probability of finishing in the money, we're gonna call it pi. So pi is not the number 3.14159, it's actually a number between zero and one, as I wrote there. And uh, you might wonder, why didn't I use p? Well, I thought you might confuse it with put and or price, so I'll use pi. Later, I actually went into a little bit of trouble when I actually want to use the number 3.14159, but I managed to finesse that. So the, um, all we're doing in this middle equation is taking this equation here and solving for the argument of the Q norm. So the argument of the Q norm is x over b. And um, the, Q, the standard normal distribution function is increasing. So there is an inverse. It cannot be written explicitly, but let's say we can't even write the integral in the first place explicitly. So, so let's write the, you know, inverse as cap n inverse and just though it exists and can always be calculated numerically. And there's actually quite a few very accurate approximations floating in the literature. Okay, so the um, now we're ready to define this tangency portfolio value function. So it's a function called TP for tangency portfolio. It's got a subscript B for Bachelier, and it's got three arguments, not two. So the three arguments are X, pi, and B. So X is the excess of strike over spot, pi is the probability of finishing the money for the put, and B is the standard deviation of the underlying 
the security price or X at maturity. Um, it's not the standard deviation of pi though. So anyway, this is the definition towards the bottom of the slide of the tangency portfolio value function. And uh, let's say you can kind of see where it came from. It came from the vanilla put value function up here, where basically what we did is if we see this Q norm, for example, there, we put a pi and um, we have this X over B in the second term. And we're writing that as Q norm inverse of pi. So that's how we sort of came to it. But the key point is that we're actually thinking of pi as a new independent variable, not one that's completely defined by its relationship to x. So this is, this is a unusual perspective, let's say. Um, if you know uh, mechanics, uh, this would be kind of what Hamilton did when he treated position and momentum as separate variables rather than um, connected variables. And um, it has certain conceptual advantages, especially if you're dealing with differential equations. So, um, so that's kind of being done here. So the, now if you look at this function of three variables called tangency portfolio value function, it's actually affine in two of the variables. So given pi, the right-hand side is affine in x, and also given b, the right-hand side is, also, sorry, given pi, the right-hand side is affine in b. So we've kind of gone from a function of two variables called vanilla put value function, which was actually convex in both x and b, to instead a new function, which is affine in x and b, because it has this third argument called pi. And um, so, okay, so that's sort of a trick that's available for this special A formula. And um, so let's, at the top of the slide, I um, you know just repeat that the vanilla put value function as a function of X and B is convex in both, while the tangency portfolio value function with three arguments is affine in two of the arguments. X and B. So there's this theorem in convex duality that I feel deserves to be better known. And um, it is that all convex functions arise via a maximization. So when I first, you know, heard this a few years ago, I was like shocked <laughs> that I didn't know it prior. Uh, so it, it basically means that, um, you know, anytime you have convexity, and no matter how you got it, um, there's an optimization lurking and um, you don't have to use it, but you know, it might help you to understand what's going on if you actually investigate what optimization is there implicitly whenever you have a convex function. So we're gonna actually look at the optimization that's implicit in the Bachelier setting you know, you might say, what optimization? It's a European option. I don't have to uh, optimize over times to maturity or, well, it's, it's sort of interesting. I mean, this result doesn't even know the context in which the convex function is being described and still says there is an optimization. So, you know, it's, it was done by a pair of mathematicians who didn't know about options at all. And still, if the value function for a put is convex in strike minus spot in the Bachelier model, their results apply. So, <clears throat> so I will apply this theorem to come to the Bachelier put pricing formula from the tangency portfolio value function. And um, that's gonna be done on the next slide. So before we do, I just wanna try and get a financial interpretation of the tangency portfolio value function. So here it is, it's defined in the second equation from the top. And um, the right hand side of that second equation from the top is clearly interpretable as the cost of holding pi contracts, each worth x, plus having the second term in cash. And um, the second term depends on pi, which is, let's say, interpretable as a probability of finishing in the money, which perhaps could be directly observed in certain contexts. So anyway, um, we take 
this tangency portfolio value function, which is here at the top again. And um, we just, because we're following what's basically dictated to us by this Fenchel Moreau theorem, we're asking what happens if you maximize it over pi? So we'll just see. So uh, even if it's not motivated economically or financially, what does this optimization do? So it's a trivial function to maximize over pi. And um, you just take the first derivative, set it equal zero, and see the consequences. And you can check that it's actually going to give a maximum, not a minimum. And um, so the, um, the result, which I don't expect, to, you know, you can follow, try to follow later, but it's, it's all right there in the slide, is that um, you get the, I'll show you a quick pricing formula from doing this optimization. So there's a picture that, um, if I had more time, I would try to draw for you, which is where you graph the vanilla put value function in Bachelier as a function of x, and of course you have an increasing con convex graph. And then you think of that graph as a um, supremum over supporting lines. So um, the lines are the, are the, the lines are the um, value of the tangency portfolio. And, um, you know, as we know, I mean, what you're actually doing is when you're replicating is holding the tangent portfolio. And then in order to sort of stay tangent, you're having to uh, change the slope of the tangent portfolio as well as the intercept. So, <clears throat> so that, um, so we, but maybe it's, you know, wasn't known to you, or maybe it was that to go from the tangency line to the curve that is tangent to just involves a maximization over the slope. So, <clears throat> Now, um, we derived the vanilla put formula in the Bachelier model by doing a maximization. And so that was exploiting convex duality. And um, the, um, let's say, but we nonetheless have martingales everywhere um, in this model. So in particular, if you evaluate the vanilla put value function, on the martingale X, which describes strike minus security price as a driftless Brownian motion, then you get that the vanilla put price is a Q martingale as well. So if you think of the representation of the vanilla put price using sort of probability theory, then um, I want you to think of it, let's say, as like this, where now, X and pi are each martingales. Um, X is a martingale because it's strike minus spot, and spot's a martingale, and strike's a constant. And then pi is actually the probability of finishing in the money. So that's just the price of a claim. It's a binary put. And so it's a martingale as well. And these two martingales, X and pi, they're related to each other. So if X goes up, pi goes up. So in the specialty model, the deeper in the money you are, the higher the probability of finishing in the money. So, um, so these martingales have what's called positive covariation. When x goes up, pi goes up. When x goes down, pi goes down. It's actually never the case in this model that one goes up and the other goes down. And um, that, um, so, so the point is that, let's say, a point of view is that you um, can sort of say to yourself, well, I need to hold pi units of x, but I know, and I know by maturity, that if I'm still holding pi units of x, I'll get the payoff of a put. But I can ask, am I able to sort of costlessly move through time holding pi units of x, or does it actually cost me money to keep holding pi units of x? And so the answer is it does cost you money to keep holding pi units of x because of the positive covariation of the two. If they're actually independent of each other, which they're not, then it wouldn't cost you any money. So the second term is actually like a cash reserve that you, you know, need to charge when you're selling a put. Um, 
as well as the cost of like buying pi units of x. And um, the cash reserve is actually sort of rated every unit of time to sort of finance the push forward of the product of the two martingales, x and pi. So um, that was probably a lot to follow, but um, that's what's being said on this slide, and we'll go through it again. So we have a forward contract value now, and um, it's a martingale. And we also have a binary put value, and it's a martingale as well. And we understand the vanilla put is just paying the product of the two martingales at maturity. So you say, well, why don't I just hold the product of them today? So you could, but that wouldn't do it that wouldn't be the right amount to charge. You actually need to charge more than that because of their covariation. It's positive. So, um, so basically what happens is every unit of time, you're going to the piggy bank and pulling out small amounts to um, finance the push forward of this product. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, when people say, well, you're always having to buy, buy, low and sell high and this is costly this is what they're referring to actually um so um so or buy high and sell low i actually got it reversed so buy high and sell low so you know when you have a convex function that's what you end up doing and um you know you basically need extra money to to deal with that and um so there's kind of an analogy i like that helps you think about it so we can take the amount in cash which is this much and think of it as kind of an electric charge on a Tesla, okay? The remaining electric charge on a Tesla. So if you own an EV electric vehicle, you may know that on the dash, it'll tell you how many miles you have left before you're empty. And um, as you're driving along with time going forward and the miles driven increasing, the amount of miles remaining on the existing charge is going towards zero. So, um, so basically what happens in this replicating a put in the Bausch model is that as long as you, you know, the volatility you use to price and replicate with is the one that's correct, then you'll deplete this cash reserve that you charged for just as the put matures. So you'll just be holding pi units of the short forward contract at maturity where pi itself will resolve to either one or zero. And so hence you'll replicate the put payoff. Okay, so I'm now at a natural um, break point again. What we've done is finish the uh, convex duality uh, perspective on um, put replication in the Bachelier model. And um, so we're about to switch to a different model, but let me take questions uh, before I do. Well, let me let me let me jump in and say we're kind of running short of time, and two of the questions are actually comments, and one's about a generalization. So why don't we dispense with the questions now? Oh, all right. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, so I will happily address those questions later. Um, okay, so we're going to do this alternative now, and so we're we're basically going to generalize the thinking. So we're going to have a tangency portfolio again. And it's gonna have the same form as it did in the Bachelier model of you're holding pi units of X and you have some cash reserves that depend on pi. And um, also depend on B, which is some measure of the uncertainty of the underlying. So in the Bachelier model, we set the cash reserves to this. And in this alternative model, we're gonna set the cash reserves to a function that looks a lot like that, but is technically different. So the new, formula for the cash reserves that I'm just sort of pulling out of thin air is that the cash reserves is B times the Shannon entropy of a Bernoulli random variable. So you may or may not be familiar with Shannon entropy, but it was invented by Shannon in 48. Um, and it was called that because it had the same mathematical structure of the entropy from the 19th century due to Boltzmann. So it's uh, kind of a big idea in information theory and um, is basically responsible for the computer I'm using to <laughs> show you this talk. And uh, so he actually developed the notion of entropy for any discrete random variable. And here I'm just using uh, Bernoulli random variable, so with only two outcomes. Um, 
And so Shannon showed that if the discrete random variable has only two outcomes, the Shannon entropy would be what's written here. So this is a measure, the Shannon entropy, of the uncertainty of this Bernoulli random variable. So an alternative measure is the variance, which would be pi times one minus pi. And um, they, let's say, it'll turn out that both measures of uncertainty are gonna be useful in this alternative model. So <clears throat> the, um, so the, you know, the, it's true in the Bachelier model and it's true in this model that the more uncertain you are about the final price, the more you need to charge in cash reserves up front. And um, so the, um, we're gonna explore like this convex dual approach to this alternative model using the cash reserves being set as proportional to Shannon entropy as opposed to being proportional to kind of this this normal, almost normal density function. So this thing that's highlighted right now is definitely not a normal density function, but it's what you might, you might call a normal density function when the domain, when the support is zero one. So that thing that's highlighted is basically a bell-shaped curve. It's just that it's supported zero one, not the whole real line. And um, so, so let's say, it's a kind of a natural thing to think about, as is the Shannon entropy. So the Shannon entropy is defined in terms of the probabilities directly. And, um, and so, as you can see from this definition. So um, it, it actually, as a measure of spread, it differs from, say, variance, where variance uses the realizations of the random variable, whereas Shannon entropy uses only the probability density or mass function. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, going with this choice, all I'm doing mathematically is putting what's in the middle into what's in the top to get what's at the bottom. And so that's gonna be our new tangency portfolio value function. And then we're gonna do just like we did before, we're going to um, maximize it over pi. So I'll skip the gory details, but it's a straightforward maximization. It's one you do in elementary calculus. And you end up, in the end, with the maximized value of the tangency portfolio being given by what I highlighted. So we're going to be exploring this function a lot. And so we're going to give it a name. And we're going to call it the vanilla put pricing formula in our new model. So the subscript on VP for vanilla put is an L there. And that L was going to stand for logistic model, which will Let's say, I'll explain the name in a moment. So we go to the next slide, and uh, this is sort of our alternative to the Bachelier put pricing formula. It's called the logistic put option pricing formula. Um, and um, so it has two inputs, X, which is the excess of strike over spot, and B, which is a measure of the uncertainty of the random variable, which is security price at maturity. And, um, this B will turn out to be proportional to the standard deviation with pure numbers is being the constant of proportionality. So, um, so anyway, the, um, we're using base E for the log here, but you could actually use any base. The, the B is actually you know, intertwining with the base. So um, if you wanted, you could actually have, um, it's hard to explain, but you could have a changing base in the log as time to maturity in years. We're not doing that. So um, <clears throat> the um, so let's say B is our analog of the standard deviation of the underlying, but it's not literally the standard deviation of the underlying, but it's positively proportional to it. And um, so if you differentiate this formula with respect to X, it only appears once and uh, there's no mysterious cancellations and you just get what's written here. And um, this, this is a CDF and it's got a name, it's a logistic CDF. So logistic distribution, you may or may not know, is a distribution describing a real valued random variable. It's symmetric, it's supported as the real line as I mentioned. And um, it's got slightly heavier tails than a Gaussian. So the heavier tails in a Gaussian is actually attractive to us because actually when you go, for example, to swaptions markets, 
you see smiles there, even though they're quoting in Bachelier implied vol, suggesting distribution of swap rates is not normal and heavier tailed than normal. So the, um, the implied risk neutral distribution in this model is logistic and um, the actual standard deviation of the underlying is, um, is um, okay, is unfortunately involving now <laughs> pi being 3.14159. Okay, so I need to change that bottom line to not confuse you with the other pi. That's the probability of finishing the money. But anyway, um, the, um, you know, the B and standard deviation are just separated by positive constants and um, <clears throat> multiplicatively. So the, um, now you could say, we're, you know, this model, how do I know it's good? Well, one thing is you can check it's arbitrage free. And then the other thing you can do is find supporting dynamics that for it. And actually, like in a paper I have, we've got two different supporting dynamics. So one is continuous and Markovian. So let's say supports the fairly classical view that you could replicate an option by dynamic trading. And then the other dynamics are pure jump, meaning replication is impossible. And for some people that's considered a plus when you're describing option pricing models because the view is that's reality. So anyway, so there's, let's say theoretical support for this alternative model. It's arbitrage free and we know exactly you know, let's say there's actually multiple supporting dynamics. And um, so the same thing is true in the Bachelier formula, by the way. So even though we derived that top formula by assuming arithmetic Brownian motion, it turns out that there are pure jump processes that can also deliver that very same formula. So um, you can't just look at a pricing formula and know the dynamics from it, it turns out. So you have to actually go look at time series. Okay. The um, two formulas, if you compare them, are, let's say, have the same number of inputs. And um, I would argue the logistic pricing formula is simpler. Um, there's this term in math called elementary function. Um, sines, cosines, exponentials, and logs are all examples of elementary functions, but um, the cumulative normal is not. So the, um, now you can write the functions for describing the puts in terms of like X, which is strike my spot and B, which is a measure of uncertainty the underlying, or you can, um, you know, write them in a slightly different form, recognizing where they came from. So the pair of equations here at the bottom kind of, you know, capture the fact that in both cases, the convexity of VP and X tells you that you could arrive to these formulas via an optimization. And the pi stars you're seeing in these formulas are the optimized probabilities of finishing the money. So, so if you write both formulas in this perhaps more complicated way at the top, you actually gain insight on Greeks. So the, so the um, if you look at this formula for say the Bachelier formula at the very top, then, um, X appears three times as before, but two of the instances are via the optimizer pi star. So if you're familiar with something called envelope theorem, which comes from economics, then you know that when you differentiate respect to a parameter such as X in the optimization, the optimization is over pi, not X, then um, you can ignore all instances of the parameter that arise via the optimizer. So basically, the uh, x's appearing in the pi star can be ignored and so you get the simple formula that you know is true. So this also works for black souls by the way and explains why there's this mysterious cancellation um, in both the black souls and Bachelier formulas. So the um, you know we, we're calculating strike derivatives this way and getting numbers between 0 and 1 for put prices. If we wanted deltas which are negative we just have to negate those numbers. So you can likewise get what I call SEGAs. So you've probably heard of Vega, which is the respect to volatility. <laughs> SEGAs is the respect to standard deviation. And um, you just can get those. Those turn out to be very simple as well. And are understood, you know, it's sort of likewise the case that this top formula that B is appearing all over the place. And yet when we finish differentiating with respect to it, 
it's appearing very simply. And it's again, the, the curious cancellation is occurring there too, and it's for the same reason. So um, I'm gonna, I am running out of time, but um, I'm going to, on this slide, basically, well, it's worth, let me try and do it because there is a key fact here that is worth knowing. So the, um, let's say first in both models, if you divide vanilla put value by B, which is the measure of uncertainty, you actually get that the value functions depend on only a single thing. Um, so the single thing could be X over B, which is sort of a Z score, or it could be pi, which is the probability of finishing the money. But in either case, you get a reduction in these models, both of them, to like a single input. This does not happen in the Black-Scholes formula. The best you can do in the Black-Scholes formula is reduce down to two inputs, which we often think of as moneyness and maturity. And so we talk about implied vol surfaces, for example, in the Black-Scholes setting. But in the Bachelier setting, if the model is actually true, let's say you can actually reduce the degree, the dimensionality down to one thing, not two. So um, it's um, a surprising thing. And um, so it, it turns out also that, like you're very familiar with the fact that when you want implied volatility from Black-Scholes model, you have to get it numerically when you have the option price. Well, the same is true in the Bachelier model if you want implied vol by stripe. But if you want implied vol by delta instead, it turns out it's just explicit. So the implied vol by delta in the Bachelier model is actually given explicitly right here. And uh, likewise, in this logistic model, it's also explicit. It's given right there. And um, actually, in this logistic model, you again have only simple functions like log, no cumulative norms, so it's incredibly simple. Um, this slide just shows that in both models, put premium is convex in volatility, and um, that's actually not true in the Black-Scholes model. So let's say score another one for both Bachelier and Logistic versus Black-Scholes. What's happening on this slide is, and I'll make these slides available, is that um, it turns out in both models, Bachelier and Logistic, that the at the money put premium are incredibly simple. They're both just linear, positively proportional to the parameter B describing the uncertainty in the underlying. So you're probably familiar with the Bachelier result that the at the money option is the standard deviation underlying divided by square root two pi. And um, so that's what that says. And um, in this alternative model, it's again the case that the at the money put is proportional to the measure of uncertainty, but now the constant proportionality is 0 0.69, which is the log of two. Um, you may not know in the Bachelier model that uh, the probability of when you buy an at the money option, the probability that you have a positive profit is just a pure number. So regardless of the time to mature the option or the volatility of the underlying, um, if you buy an at-the-money put in the Bachelier model, the probability of a positive profit is 0.345. <laughs> it literally is that. Okay, I mean, there's more decimals after that, but um, the, it's a number. It's not a formula that depends on the volatility or the time of maturity. The same thing happens in the logistic alternative. It turns out if you buy an at-the-money put and ask for the probability of profit, it's uh, one third. It's literally one third. <laughs> it's uh, exactly one third. <laughs> so, okay. <clears throat> okay, so I just like to finish up with a property of the logistic model. Well, so this is yet another break. Um, I guess um, there's no other questions, so I'll keep moving. Um, here's a, the last part of my talk, and it's basically looking at what the logistic model has that the Bachelier model does not, and asking, um, besides simplicity and besides heavy tailedness. And um, it turns out that this logistic model is extremely friendly to early exercise. So um, let me explain that a bit. So first, I want to switch attention from a vanilla put to instead a married put. So a married put turns out to be nothing but the vanilla put and its underlying together. And um, the payoff from a married put 
is nothing but the maximum of the strike price of the put and the price of the underlying of the put. So it's straightforward and logistic model to value this married put just by adding the current price of the underlying to the vanilla put formula. And it turns out that you get this formula, which is B times log of a sum of two exponentials. And um, we're going to treat this valuation of a married put as a new kind of addition. So this will be foreign to you, I'm sure. But um, people who do abstract algebra consider types of addition that are you know, more general than just the kind you were taught in kindergarten, and, um, or maybe first grade. And um, let's say all that's demanded is that the same sort of operational properties of ordinary addition are required of, a, of any new addition. So it should be commutative. The order in which the two numbers are, are presented doesn't matter. It should be associative. And um, there, sh there should be an analog of zero. So anything, if you add zero to anything, you get it back. And um, here, the equivalent of zero turns out to be minus infinity. So with this funny type of addition, if, for example, you, it's, it's value married put, but if giving you the max of strike and spot at maturity, but if the strike happened to be minus infinity, then the value is just a security price because obviously you're not, gonna, you're not going to have minus infinity be the maximum. So, um, so anyway, let's say what this slide does is it tries to get you familiar with the algebraic structure that's uh, relevant for married put pricing and pricing of other derivatives. And um, so it does so by asking you to consider something very familiar, which is how do you add and subtract and multiply and divide when you're dealing with only non-negative numbers? So like an issue is that you can't necessarily subtract. So for example, two subtract three gives you minus one and that's not a non-negative number. So the name of the algebraic structure where you can add and you can multiply and you can divide, but you may not necessarily be allowed to subtract is called a semi-field. And um, it turns out the structure that's relevant for optionality in this logistic context is also a semi-field. So what replaces ordinary addition is this optionality binary operation that was on the last slide. And what replaces ordinary multiplication is actually ordinary addition. So um, to give you a feel for it, um, so what we were doing when we were say, um, if you like if, if over here, when you're looking at the payoff um, of a, a married put, like basically we're thinking of max as a binary operation corresponding to addition. And we're actually thinking of ordinary addition here as a binary operation corresponding to multiplication, which you're probably not used to thinking about. But let's say the reason we say it that way is because this plus distributes over that max, just as ordinary multiplication distributes over ordinary addition. So, you know, this kind of trivial statement that the payoff of a put plus its underlying is the max of the strike and underlying can be interpreted with saying plus distributes over max. And that's occurring in maturity. But prior to maturity, we're also having that ordinary plus is actually distributing over um, this new binary operation. So it opens up a possibility of doing simple arithmetic, let's say, or maybe not so simple, but arithmetic anyway, with derivative securities. And um, in particular, the um, interesting point of view is that when you look at the right-hand side with the glasses that you've been using since you learned about ordinary addition, ordinary multiplication, you say the right-hand side is nonlinear in A1 and A2. But when you look at the left-hand side, if you actually think of that funny circle plus B as just a new type of addition, then it's trivially linear in A1 and A2. So this perspective basically lets you take the nonlinear evaluation functions that arise in derivative security evaluation all the time and rethink of them as linear in this new arithmetic. So you get to use linear algebra in, um, in, this, in this new setting. You just have to be careful because subtraction in linear algebra has to be, let's say, you have to be careful with that. So I talk about an application in words in these slides. And 
long story short, because we're running out of time, um, I consider the notion of an insured futures contract. So as you know, with a standard futures contract, long pays short the price change every day. And as in, you know, let's say if the underlying drops a lot, <laughs> that long pays short a lot. So, um, so the, um, so to prevent that, let's say, we can imagine that long is willing to pay a positive premium up front and receive the option to exchange any normal payment they would have had to make for a constant that's agreed to up front. So if, for example, and they get to do it at most once, and they get to choose when to do it just after the realization. So for example, you're long one of these insured futures contracts on S&P 500. Let's just pretend S&P 500 and go negative. It's okay. And uh, S&P 500 drops by a lot. So in the normal course of events, if you were long a futures and S&P dropped by a lot, you'd pay a lot in marking the market. But because you have one of these insured futures, you say, I exercise. And as a result, you don't pay the marking the market. You don't pay the price change for that day. You pay instead a contractually specified amount, which is finite. And um, so that's, you know, and you get to choose just after the realization. And so that's uh, what I'll call an insured futures. So in this logistic model, it turns out that there's a simple formula for valuing it. And it's just, let's say, it's just a sum of the new kind. So it's um, incredibly easy to think about the right kind of early exercise using this arithmetic. Okay, so let's um, wrap up. So to summarize, we reviewed the pricing of binary and vanilla puts in the Bachelier model. And um, we also developed an alternative model called logistic model. And there we priced binary, vanilla, and married puts. The two formulas look fairly different as functions of strike and spot. But when you write them as functions of strike delta, which was pi, then actually they have the same basic structure of x times pi plus the cash reserve written as a function of pi. And it's just how we model that cash reserve that differs. So the common structure allows you to find common features. So for example, they can each depend on a single variable. They're each convex in their measure of the spread of the underlying. Um, but there are also differences. And um, the logistic model is simpler in that the price or the implied vol is just an elementary function of the inputs, whereas that's not true for Bachelier. And um, the second difference is that there's this algebraic link that can, let's say, reduce the nonlinear uh, way of thinking that you're used to for derivatives valuation into instead what's called pseudo-linear thinking. So that can be applied to value Bermudan style derivatives and um, let's say in closed form, whereas usually we think of Bermudan style derivatives as requiring numerical evaluation using either, either finite differences or Monte Carlo. So um, just some extensions. Um, you might think that this algebraic approach requires a real valued underlying because that's the context in which it's presented, but it doesn't. I have a paper where we have a non-negative underlying so we have a sort of competitor to Black-Scholes um, that has heavier tails than Black-Scholes and has this algebraic treatment and also um, is, um, can be, like let's say, has as much symmetry as the models we saw in this talk. And um, okay, so, so that's pretty much all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. I know I went fast at the end, but we can um, take questions now. And I see that David Bates has one. So he's asking or saying, I assume your implicit risk neutral distributions for logistic option pricing will be symmetric. Your assumption is correct, David. <laughs> You're right as always. Um, so, and, you know, and, and I'm glad you raised this point. So let's say what you're probably getting at is there's asymmetry also in markets, uh, given your work. <laughs> I'm sure you're, that's what you're thinking and you're correct. And um, this logistic model does not, as written, does not um, handle asymmetry, just as the Bachelier model as written does not. So what one can do to handle asymmetry is to extend the models. So just as one can extend the Bachelier model to handle asymmetry by allowing you know, stochastic and correlated volatility, 
the same thing could be done uh, with this logistic model. Um, actually, this logistic model, by the way, is in fact an independent um, stochastic time change of the Bachelier model. So the fact that the time change is independent is what's causing the symmetry that I'm confessing to. And um, so, um, so definitely that should be an extension as well. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, did, uh, are there any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Any other questions? Uh, yes, so there is one. So the, it, it reads that the at the money put is a lot more expensive than the Bachelier put. So yes, it is more expensive. And um, is it due to the heavier tails? Yes. So the answer is yes. Or is there another economic reason? No, it's, I mean, let's say, well, I mean, it's due to the heavier tails, yes. And um, I mean, there's an issue of, you know, how do you, how do you choose to um, equate the two models? So I've actually thought about that. Like, let's say, you know, a Black-Scholes volatility, then how do you uh, find the corresponding Bachelier volatility? How do you find the corresponding logistic model volatility? So there's multiple answers to that question, but anyway, um, the, um, but I think like, let's say a common way of thinking is that you would actually force the at the money values to be the same. And then you would examine the differences as you go into the tails. And, um, and you would see differences with the logistic model always having a higher price if, when you're out of the money. So, um, so, you know, the, let's say, it's one thing to say we have heavy tails, it's another thing to say why. <laughs> and the standard explanations for heavy tails are stochastic volatility, jumps, and um, you can actually prove that if you independently randomize volatility, you will get heavy tails. I know a proof of that. And um, probably others do too. So you cannot get thin tails for independently randomizing volatility. And, um, whereas if you allow correlation, you can. <laughs> okay, so, um, so anyway, um, and of course you could be much, much more sort of economical as opposed to, let's say, being statistical is um, you think of the, the heavy tails as a consequence of risk aversion. And um, now we're probably all familiar with the fact that if you have continuous sample paths and you change measure, you do not change the volatility, and that's true. Um, but if you do not have continual sample paths, if you start from a process with jumps and now you change measure, the um, whole jump distribution under the risk neutral measure can be different. And um, so this can induce the, the, you know, the, the higher pricing of out of the money options and, and explain it as due to risk aversion. <clears throat> All right. Okay, well, I'll take the floor here to uh, thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, very enlightening talk, uh, very timely uh, talking about negative prices. Uh, it's been a rich talk, so for those of you who would like to uh, go over it again, it's going to be, the, it's going to be